That was All great. right, Get started. Caitlin, if you would, oh, you've, already, you've got us, awesome. Well, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we appreciate that right now is an interesting time for many of you and that there are quite a few um, of you who are at home. Um, many of you who are living with many distractions, <laughs> um, children and barking dogs and spouses or, you know, all those things. So we appreciate that you made time for us. We also appreciate that there are folks who are considered um, critical staff right now who are not able to uh, be at home like we are. And so we're thinking of all of them. We want to make sure that we, um, as the American School Health Association, are supporting you all as best we can. So just so you know, we have some things coming out very soon uh, just by way of resources to um, to help support everyone as they move forward during this really interesting time. So uh, my name is Jeannie Alter. I'm the Executive Director of the American School Health Association and I welcome you to this webinar today. Um, I just wanna tell you a little bit about ASHA and who we are before we get started. Um, the mission of the American School Health Association is to transform all schools into places where every student learns and thrives. And this involves healthy students who learn and achieve in safe and healthy environments, nurtured by caring adults and functioning within coordinated school and community support systems. I think all of this is really important and I think hitting home with us right now um, about the, ne the necessity of coordinating and working together. So um, I think our work is very important, especially now. Uh, just a little bit about membership. Um, being a member of the American School Health Association has a variety of member, uh, a variety of benefits, including uh, our Journal of School Health, which is our peer-reviewed journal. Um, as a member, you get a, a print or online version of our journal each month. Uh, also, continuing education, our members receive free continuing education for things like this webinar today, for our annual conference, and for things like our Josh Self Studies. Um, we also have a variety of discounts that are available to our members. And then you just get access to the information and expertise from our members, from our uh, annual conference, our biweekly newsletter. And uh, we invite you all to connect with us through social media and that'll give you a good idea of the kinds of things that um, um, we can offer and the kinds of expertise that we have at our fingertips. I want to let you know that um, the ASHA conference is going to be coming to Albuquerque September 30th through October 2nd. Uh, our registration will open May 1st is the plan. Uh, with the current situation, that may be a bit delayed, but we are um, shooting for May 1st. Uh, also, um, there are sponsorship opportunities available. If you are working for an organization that would like to exhibit or something like that, please take an opportunity to check out our website and look into those sponsorship opportunities. So I wanted to, <clears throat> excuse me, welcome today's presenters, Dr. William Hesse and Dr. Chris Lineberry, um, who will be presenting today. I've asked them to take a moment to um, introduce themselves uh, and and uh, then I'll turn it over to you all. So Chris, you wanna introduce yourself? Sure, good morning. Uh, my name is Chris Lineberry. I am uh, a co-founder of Core Purpose Consulting and my, um, I'm also a principal at Apache Junction High School in Arizona. Um, I am uh, sending out good vibes and wishes to everyone this morning. I know that as educators, um, we're all facing some really difficult times right now. And uh, I think that it's great that we're actually ha that we're having this webinar this morning because it gives us an opportunity to share with one another and connect. And I think that's extremely important at this time. So um, I, uh, I've, I've been in a passionate advocate for the education of the whole child and promoting health and wellness in schools uh, my entire career, um, and I'll share a little bit more about that as we get into the presentation, but we're thrilled to be here. I want to thank Jeannie and Caitlin for inviting us 
and given us the opportunity to share with all of you this morning. And we, we're thrilled that all of you are here as well. Shane? Thanks, Chris. Hi, everybody. My name's uh, William Hesse. I'm here in sunny Arizona, although it's been raining all day. Um, welcome, and we are so excited to work with you today. Um, my background, a former professor at Arizona State University, designed their healthy school curriculum for, for them, uh, current wellness champion and co-founder at Core Purpose Consulting, uh, where we are going to show you our ultimate guide to healthy school design and impl implementation today. So welcome, uh, Jeannie and Caitlin, thanks for having us. And we look forward to working with you for the next hour. All right, so I'm gonna start and share my screen. So give me just a second to get set up here. And I'd like to add that if any of you have any questions, feel free to type those in the chat box. All right. Is everybody able to see my screen? Um, no. Hmm. It helps if I hit the share button um, first <laughs> so that you can see my screen. Now are you able to? Yep. Okay, great. So, um, The title of the presentation was um, and, and has been in a lot of different areas where we've done this, the how to run a four minute mile. And um, the reason we, we say that is in 1955, it was considered to be medically impossible for a human being to run the mile in under four minutes. And uh, I can tell you that today for me, it's still medically impossible um, to run the four minute mile. However, uh, in 1956, Roger Bannister broke that four minute mark. And they actually told him that in order to break the mark, if somebody were to go under four minutes in the mile, they would die. So after he did it, he was laying on the ground and they ran over to him and he asked them if they were angels um, because he thought that he was dead. Um, the, the importance of that is that in 1956, Roger Bannister became the first person, and that same year, 17 other people broke that mark. And running faster than four minutes in the mile didn't get easier. Running faster than four minutes in the mile got possible. And that's really what we want to talk about today when it comes to school health, that there have been others who have come before us who have been able to incorporate health and wellness into school and if it can be done in one place, we believe that it can be done um, everywhere else. So if you would, just take a moment to um, clear your mind. This next slide should be blank. And uh, if you would, close your eyes for just a moment. Now, when you close your eyes, what I'd like you to, unless you're driving, please, if you're driving, don't close your eyes. But uh, what I would like for you to do is when you close your eyes, imagine that you're receiving a gift. Now, this gift, I think it's important to tell you a little bit about it before I show it to you. Um, think about what it might look like, um, who, how it's wrapped, is it wrapped, how big is it? Um, what will it, what will it do for you and how will it change things for you? So just take a moment to close your eyes and think about that if you would. Go ahead and open your eyes. Does anybody know what that is? I, I can't hear you, but my, uh, I would imagine or hope that many of you would realize that that is a Tiffany's box. And uh, unfortunately, um, that is not the kind of gift that I can give you today. As much as I would like to send all of you a Tiffany's box uh, with something in it from Tiffany's, even better. However, this gift that I'm, I'm talking about, the day that I received it, came to me smaller than a pinhead. And 
had the ability to change my life in ways that I never expected or, or had thought possible. Um, it caused me to rethink my reality. It caused me to rethink my purpose as a principal, as an educator. And it's given me the ability to, or the opportunity to be able to talk to school leaders across the country. When I received this gift on January 6th, of 2006, this is what it sounded like. And this is what it felt like. And this is what I almost lost. I was 35 years old. I was a first year principal and my blood pressure was 157 over 109 and I was having a heart attack at school. Um, that day changed my life. At that time, I was a single father and uh, I was scared out of my mind. And what I found out was much of the, the problem that, that I experienced had to do with stress. And if you work in a school, I think we can all agree that schools are stressful institutions, especially, especially right now. Um, I think just being a human being right now is a bit stressful for many of us with uh, social distancing, et cetera. And we're all in different states and we all have different things that are happening in our states, but we all have the commonality of caring about kids, caring about their well being, and loving and caring about our families and ourselves. And uh, the day that I had my heart attack changed me. When that happened, um, I decided that I needed to relook at my purpose as an educator. Um, for much of the time, I was very concerned about test scores, very concerned about um, making sure that my school letter grade went up. And it did, but it took a toll. And what I came to realize as a result of this was I really needed to reevaluate my purpose. And at Core Purpose, we believe that that's one of the issues that many of our educators have today is that the purpose has kind of been lost in the pressure for test scores and for higher student academic achievement. And in the process of doing that, I think we've lost a lot of our effectiveness um, as well as cause teachers to burn out, administrators to burn out um, and health problems for people because they're not taking care of themselves. You know, if you go down the hallways in your mind of your school and you look at the, um, the, the physical health and well-being or mental health and well-being of your teachers, I know that as I do that, I see, many teachers who are stressed out by, beyond belief, many who are exhausted, many who are not physically taking care of themselves. And it's not because they're bad people or lazy people, it's the exact opposite. They care so much and they work so hard because they wanna do a good job for their kids. So as most of you probably know in this audience that for the first time in 100 years, the lifespan of children has been declining and is declining due to the increase in overweight. And that this may be the first generation of parents to outlive their children. Um, this is serious stuff. And the good news about this is we can do something about it. Um, in my school, we were able to de decrease student uh, obesity. Uh, we moved from 56 kids who were in the 85th percentile or above in grades K through five. They moved, we moved it to 44 who were in the 85th percentile or above, which means in essence, we may have added 17 to 27 years of lifespan to those kids' lives by decreasing their chances of developing type two diabetes. And I think this really gets back to what is our purpose, is our purpose to educate or to school? And I'd be interested to see in the comments section what some of your thoughts are on the difference between educating and schooling. If you wouldn't mind 
just typing in your responses there. And I can't see my chat, ladies, so if you might be able to help me, that would be great with some, what some of the responses are. Chris, can you hear me? I can, Shane. Um, one question was, what, what is the difference to educate and to the school? Another one believed that education um, to educate is to educate everybody. And edu ed to educate is the result. Um, educating is for a lifetime, makes a lifelong impact. Right, and, and what is schooling? I think is the next question. And so I do think that there's a difference between these two things, and for me, the difference is that education has to do with life. You know, the test that I want my kids to pass is the test that life is going to give them as they graduate and they move on to uh, college or another school um, uh, beyond high school. Um, when I was at the elementary level, my goal was to educate them to be able to be successful at whatever they chose to do with their lives, um, hopefully uh, high school followed by college. Um, I think schooling has to do with teaching to a test and trying to get kids to learn the specific things that we want them to know in order to be able to boost our test grade. I'm, not, I'm certainly not against accountability. There's a great quote from Jim Collins. Um, one time... <laughs> One time I was doing this talk and I said there was a great quote from Tom Collins, which was a bit of a Freudian slip. Um, but there's a great quote from Jim Collins that says that blood and marrow are essential to human life, but not the purpose of it. And I think in this regard, testing and accountability are essential to education, but they are not the purpose of it. And when we connect to that purpose of being able to give kids long, happy, healthy, enjoyable, rewarding lives and improve their quality of life as well as their academic achievement, then we really have done what it is that we set out to do. You know, in, on my campus, we talk about our why quite frequently. What is your why? And I think it's important that staff be aware of what their why is. And not only do I think it's important for staff to be aware of what their why is, I think it's important for kids to know what their why is. And I've asked all of my teachers to post their why in their classroom. That way, uh, if the why is to reach and teach and engage every kid, and um, maybe that day the teacher's having an off day or they're, they're, they're struggling somehow and they've drifted from that, Maybe by seeing that or a kid asking them, what's your why? Or I thought you were here to do this. Although um, I, I think that helps teachers to reground and reconnect. We had shirts made that say, uh, ask me my why. And what I tell kids when they ask me my why is I tell them quite, quite frankly, my why is you. We're, I'm here for you. I come to school every day because I'm difference in your life and academic that social emotional and that's your physical health and um, I think that whenever we share that message with teachers teachers are very empowered and they get excited because when they were in college or when they were in high school or they were in elementary school and they decided that they wanted to become a teacher they decided that because they connected with a teacher who made them feel good about themselves and gave them hope and showed them that they were better than they thought they were and could achieve more. And when teachers connect to that, I think it's very exciting for them. And I think that we can help improve teacher morale and teacher efficacy by connecting to that purpose on a daily basis. Um, the best example I can think of that is, you know, um, everybody here I'm sure knows who Mike Tyson is. 
Um, he was the most brutal uh, boxer in the late 80s, 90s in the world. Um, you'd pay $65, $75 for a pay-per-view fight with Tyson in it, and it would last to eight seconds um, before he'd knock somebody out. He fought a guy named Buster Douglas for the national heavyweight title, and a week before the fight, Buster Douglas's mother died. Um, and Buster Douglas had to make a decision whether he wanted to continue to fight or he wanted to mourn his mother's death. And he decided to fight. And in the first round, he got knocked down um, and was saved by the bell at the seven count. And four rounds later, he shocked the world and he knocked Mike Tyson out. And when they talked to him about how he had done it and how he was able to overcome the adversity of his mother passing so close to the fight, what he said was really powerful. He connected to his why. He said he had told his mom that he was going to knock Mike Tyson out. And his mom had told all her friends, my baby's going to knock Mike Tyson out. His why, <clears throat> excuse me, his why was bigger than Mike Tyson. And I think that if our why is bigger than our obstacle, there's nothing that can stop us. If our obstacle is bigger than our why, then I think quite often the obstacle wins. So we got to give teachers a big why and help them to connect to that. Um, one of the things that we're trying to do, and I'm going to let Shane talk about our, uh, our healthy ultimate guide to healthy schools here in a second. But one of the things that we're doing in um, here in North Carolina, or in Arizona, I don't even know what state I'm in anymore um, here in Arizona is we are, um, we've created a podcast and uh, that podcast is called um, the prospectors pickaxe. And I'm, I'm trying to pull it up right now so I can show it to you. Um, give me one second. All right. So this is the website for the prospectors pickaxe. And what, what you'll see here is a number of different um interviews that, that I've been lucky enough to be able to do with some really incredible people. Um, Jimmy Gary Jr. from Orange is the New Black and When They See Us and former NFL player uh, shares kind of his story of overcoming adversity and how he's dealing with this social distancing that we've been asked to implement and staying positive and using this as an opportunity to not only improve himself, but to get ready for the next chapter in his life whenever this is all over and the door is open, are we going to be ready? And what, what I talked about in the first one that we did was building a strong house. And, uh, you know, there's a book called Chop Wood and Carry Water where the, the author of the book, um, it's a fable about two men who, uh, a, man, a young man who goes and becomes, a, wants to become an archer. And one of the first tasks they have to complete is building their shelter. And as he's complaining about it and he's building it, his teacher says to him, you know, every day, what matters about today is the process you're engaging in and who you're becoming. And every day we're building our house. Every day we're building our house. You may think you're building it for your family. You may think you're building it for your team or for your school, but every day you're building your house. This is an opportunity with the social distancing and reconnecting to our family, slowing down to the speed of life that we can shore up that foundation that, um, th that, that holds our house up so that whenever this is over, we can come out bigger, better, stronger, and uh, more able to serve one another than we ever have before. So um, I would invite you to, uh, to listen to the podcast. It's 100% free. And if you have a story that you think you'd like to share that would be powerful, then I would love to talk with you about it and uh, get you on the podcast and share your story with others around the country. Because I think that being able to connect with our students and being able to connect with each other during this time is extremely important. Um, I wish I could say that this idea was mine alone. It was not. Um, I did what all good educators do. I stole it. A friend of mine who is a principal in our district, Pat Smith, read a bedtime story on Facebook to her kids the other night uh, on Facebook Live. 
and she got tons of positive feedback. And I thought, well, how can I reach out to a high school group and maybe build a online community in our community and in the community of educators throughout the country. So my goal is to be able to share stories and experiences and how we're getting through this difficult time because it does not look like it's going to be ending anytime soon. And we have to make sure that we're taking care of ourselves. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and turn it over to Shane or William Hesse, sorry. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Chris, what I love and everybody, what I love about uh, the podcast is what you're about to see in the ultimate guide to healthy school design and implementation is that the nine national experts that are the authors all have uh, their own style of virtual coaching uh, embedded in the guide. And Chris's podcast are one of those um, coaching, virtual coaching opportunities. Uh, and it really makes it a unique experience for uh, the, the user. Uh, here's the cover and within it, um, and just to preface, we, Chris and I have uh, put the last decade or more of our work into making a, a visual and virtual opportunity to help educators and students and parents and administrators uh, put everything together in regards to what does a comprehensive, healthy school, healthy community look like. And with the given circumstances, our team is actually working uh, on making a updated remote version for this. So as we go through the different modules in the healthy school guide, um, if there's opportunity to share some of the experiences uh, in a remote setting, uh, we will do so. And feel free to chat about that if you have questions on how that looks, uh, but we, are, um, we should have that out in the next couple days. Um, and let me preface this before we get into the contents. I'd like you to think about the Healthy School Design Guide as a virtual platform, a foundational platform that is used to inspire and support what is happening um, in schools, uh, in the remote schooling options that are approaching. Uh, and that is either from an administrator to a uh, educator standpoint or a uh, teacher to a student standpoint or in the current remote version uh, it could be the online teacher to student or parent homeschooling to student as well as having that student to student leadership opportunity and interaction so again this is more of an inspirational foundation for support uh, not a curriculum and not a, uh, a program to implement. So I just want to kind of preface that and share that with you guys. And let's talk about what's embedded. We have uh, the different modules embedded, our healthy school, healthy community. And we do follow the WISC model, the whole school, whole child, whole community model that the CDC has put out uh, to every school in the country. Uh, and I'll show you a quick teaser here in, in a second where, uh, uh, Chris is the featured administrator in those videos, but we do follow that model. Um, so a lot of the things are, are research based that you'll see here, but that's where the most of the modules will come from. Um, social emotional climate is a big topic right now and how that looks with the current situation um, is key. Equity in education, healthy leadership, healthy classrooms, uh, and this will be again, healthy virtual classrooms, physical activity, nutrition, and then we also have uh, our own awards for, I don't know about you, Chris, but I, I'm pretty competitive. So I like, uh, I like to have some awards to go after and, and um, absolutely let's, let's step through this. Um, so these are a table of contents. It's about 90 to 100 pages. Um, quickly, I'll go through some of the authors. That's myself and Chris. Um, Heidi, she's based out of Phoenix. She's our equity expert. Um, 
Shannon and Laura, Social Emotional, and Dr. Smith. She's um, in North Carolina with Dr. Davis. They do some of the healthy leadership aspects. Kyleen Bogdan, she's our nutritionist. From, she's the Cleveland Cavaliers nutritionist. And Cindy Boyum, she's out of Minnesota. And she does our um, social emotional connection and she's wonderful. Uh, as we go through this, each of, uh, each of the sections of the guide, they, they have an overview to help, uh, like Chris talked about earlier, connect different lives and purposes of, of what you're trying to implement um, into the school or into the classroom or into the community. It has multiple resources for you, including virtual coaching. Um, so if you love Chris's podcast, uh, he, his sections are great. He connects those to it. And you can simply click the link right in there and it goes right to his virtual coaching option. Uh, support tools. So at the end of each of these, you'll see a different uh, toolkit or support mechanism where you can um, complete your, your benchmarks and um, check your progress and do assessments based on, let's just choose social emotional, based on what you've already implemented at you know, the current setting or what you plan to implement. And you can use those support tools for uh, a comprehensive um, report to your administrator or to a state department for compliance or for the different awards that are out there. Um, or uh, to share some of your stories with Asha and the great things that uh, Genius is doing. Um, and lastly, the uh, upgrade opportunities. There's always opportunities for professional development with any of our, our nine authors that are embedded. But our ultimate goal, which we shared earlier, is let's, let's show you how to increase some academic success, increase student engagement, and um, I don't think we're going to have many discipline referrals going on at this moment, but uh, in the school setting, um, that's definitely something that uh, we help with. So I'd like to share with you as we begin that this, this journey through the different modules, I'd like to share with you the foundational uh, teaser from the CDC. Uh, just so you know, we are, it is research based, but let's take a look at Chris and Hey Shane, I found the video that is um, exclusive to Stanfield that I can share. Okay. So go ahead and talk. Sorry about that. And when you're done, I'll share it. Okay. All right, guys. So this is about one minute. And uh, really the premise is to demonstrate that every school, every community that we have um, is going to have a different approach now more than ever. Let's take a look. We haven't seen this yet. Shane, if you will, uh, stop sharing us on an integral part of Stop sharing? Stop sharing so I can share my screen. unable to hear the audio on that video okay give me one second I apologize for Shane, I'm going to let you share yours. This isn't working. I'll let you share yours. Okay. I think you have to uh, log off. Yeah, there you go. All right. Let's see if we can get back here. And here's that uh, one minute teaser. And let us know uh, what you guys think. <laughs> Health and wellness are an integral part of what we do because we see what we do as being key 
to kids being academically successful. The whole school, whole community, whole child model, or the WISC model, is our approach to addressing health in schools. It's student-centered, it focuses on the connections between health and academic achievement, and the role that the community plays in supporting the school. There are promising practices, but there's no prescribed approach on how to use it. It's going to look different in each school because each school is going to determine what their unique needs and priorities are. I really hope that the viewers will be inspired by these stories shared and access the many resources available to them as they try to make their environment healthier for their children. Oftentimes, is that people think we have to decide between health and wellness and academic success. I contend, and our school district would contend, we can do both. Awesome. Chris, does it ever get old getting to, uh, to watch that? Well, I, I prefer not to look at myself, but getting to see the outstanding work that... Um, that others have done and that we were able to do and being recognized by the CDC and the uh, National Association of Chronic Disease Directors really was uh, cool. And then ASHA, last year we won the um, WISC School of the Year um, in uh, 2019. So, um, you know, I, I, I think that again, the, the, the point of showing that is that if we can do it at a school like Stanfield. And to give you a little background on Stanfield, the average annual income in Stanfield, North Carolina, or Arizona, the average annual income is $5,000 annually. Um, that's a year. We're a Title I school. 95% of my kids were 20% or below the national poverty level. 20% uh, Native American, 75% Hispanic, and 5% and everything else. And we were able to do some things through the WISC model and through uh, the model that we've created at Core Purpose where we incorporated um, PE every day for every kid in grades K through 8. We implemented recess three times a day, uh, once in the morning, once at lunch, and once in the afternoon. And our school was in improvement steps, meaning that um, we were in danger of the state taking over. Um, at that point, I was, we had a lot of turnover and I was trying to make change and I was being pressured by many to move away from the healthy model and incorporating health and wellness into the curriculum and requiring recess. I've told my teachers that recess is not to be used as a form of punishment, that if they took away recess, I was going to take away math. And um, I, I had one who tried to <laughs> tried to see if I was serious, and, and um, it only took that one time for people to know that I meant what I said. Recess and physical activity, physical education are as important to the healthy development as a child as, as reading and math are. So we started in, in improvement, and in two years, we were able to move out of improvement status, which is a huge accomplishment in such an impoverished area with such a challenging population and we were still able to meet the health and wellness needs of our kids so i, I think it's really important you know you, i hear lots of people saying well i can't because of this or i can't because of that and again your why has got to be bigger than the obstacle and if it is yes you can do it um, we did it and we're nobody special there are lots of schools across the country who are doing it as well Thank you, Chris. Um, you know, and we talk about connecting to the why. Uh, and if we look at this as a, a whole approach to the whole child, not just the child from the neck up, every, if every school is different, we have to take uh, an assessment, uh, which if you look here at number two, assessing the situation, uh, again, especially now assessing the situation and the school and what those needs are and finding out what your low hanging fruit is and where can we start is social emotional the, the hottest topic in america in american education right now is that where we need to start what is the the need for your school and that's that's kind of what we talk about through here um to to take that assessment and number two and 
And number three, choose that low hanging fruit and begin. And some schools are already embedding some amazing ideas. And again, if you look at this more as a framework, um, everything really comes together and it's, it's, you're able to make a fully comprehensive, healthy school and all those different modules that we talked about. Um, right now, if you talk about school-based level, the foundations of this is, is nominating a wellness champion in each of your campuses. Um, right now, Chris, if you agree, uh, and all of you guys, if you agree, I believe that every teacher right now uh, with our uh, possibly going to online schooling for the rest of the season, every teacher, or every parent that is educating our children are wellness champions in their own right. Um, and I think we're going to need this support and inspiration more than ever right now. Um, Without a doubt. Yes. Okay. Uh, number two, the uh, establishing a shack team, that's really just a support mechanism. And I think we could do that. Uh, you already have the support of Asha and Jeannie and Caitlin and, and Chris and I to help build that, but you're um, don't feel like you're alone in this. Uh, we can still, even with the, uh, the challenging situation, we can build a student, a school health advisory council um, and teachers and supporters here to help you. Uh, number three is building a SWAT team. That's a student wellness advocacy team. Our students can still lead uh, at their homes. They can still lead and, and do things. Um, and they're going to need that healthy guidance more than ever right now to uh, make this sustainable and talk about your successes. I, I, Chris is doing his podcast and um, Asha is doing a wonderful job with uh, promoting and, and staying um, above everything that's going on and showing that healthy connections. Um, we could do the same uh, through our websites and through our social media. And you know, Chris, you, you mentioned earlier about your friend that was reading and uh, you know, those are things that we can do to brand our, our healthy approach. Shane, so, can you talk a little bit about what SWAT is doing at your school and um, what that looks like. I, th I think what Shane's done at Sandra Day O'Connor High School, um, we are working on implementing at Apache Junction High School. Um, and we did at, at Stanfield, but on the elementary level, it looks very different than it does on the high school level. So Shane, can you talk a little bit with the, uh, with the folks that are participating about what it is exactly that SWAT does and how you've empowered kids to lead on your campus? Chris, I think you bring up a great point. Um, one of the unique things about having the uh, ultimate guide in your hands is that every aspect in here can be student led. And I know as an educator myself, uh, whenever I get asked to do something extra and more and more, my plate just keeps filling up. And this uh, is truly something when we can empower the students to lead, uh, takes things off my plate. And that has been a game changer um, in, in my educational world and, and everyone's that uh, is support this. But uh, this is, this just really steps you through on how to build it. This is a, uh, a local high school in Arizona. They have 1,400 of their 2,500 students that are actively involved in their student wellness. Wellness is a um, huge part of their culture. And if we believe culture can drive success, um, this is a, a huge opportunity to do it. I often talk about how um, our administration and our, our teachers um, delineate to our students uh, and try to implement and do some great things and our students, if they're the, the groundwork of this, I uh, often speak about how they rise up and they connect to our, our educators and our, our administrators um, from the ground floor up instead of you know, from the, the top down. And when those two connect, when they intersect, you really have a better culture, increased academics, uh, decreased student referrals, uh, student engagement, and then it really just changes the culture and gives students a reason to come to school. So, and, you, and your kids have done a lot, like they set up a group that wanted to improve the environmental health on campus and of, uh, of Deer Valley and started a recycling program. They've done some things to bring awareness to dating violence and ending dating violence. They've done pregame meal prep. Um, what else, Shane? Yoga, mindfulness. And it's all student-led, which is really incredible. 
Yeah, Chris, we're uh, at that school. They have about 57 different projects that uh, work uh, in the different 10 dimensions of wellness, uh, trying to improve culture. And it's not just at their campus. They, they're student leaders. Uh, I know we had taken students over to Chris's school and to different high schools, and those leaders have worked back and forth. In fact, even in the current situation, the students have still been using their social media to connect um, to make sure that the health and wellness is still maintained. Um, if not, um, it's even more important. So uh, it's a great way to connect uh, your your stakeholders and, and change culture, whether we're online or on campus. I think uh, SWAT is, a, is an awesome opportunity uh, to implement and that kind of helps step you through that. I do like to share, uh, I know our, if we have any anyone in Nevada right now, they, they coined the, the phrase SWAG instead of SWAT, Student Wellness Advocacy Group, because they felt SWAG uh, was a, uh, was a a more the, that word connected with them a lot more and it doesn't ma what, matter what you call it it's, it's the principle of it and, and, and the why so um, as we continue through this I think we have about five more minutes until we're going to open up questions so I want to kind of step you through some of the other modules but this uh, healthy work site that is for your staff and student or staff only um, we mentioned the, the sh building a shack team. This actually steps you through it and how the FNS guidelines from the USDA talks about every school should have an identified wellness team and a shack team. So Chris does a great job with this um, lesson. If you could see at the very end how the toolkit, you could use it on your tablet or your phone and you can actually fill in your specific school data on this uh, screenshot and send it to uh, anyone that that needs to see it. Social emotional climate is huge. And I know everybody has different things that they're implementing and putting in place. And that's really, again, this is just an opportunity to make those connections. Uh, but mindful technology is a big thing um, that's happening on campus and ways to navigate through that. Um, there are some different lessons that if you're a parent or a teacher, you'd like to uh, delineate uh, through your social networking right now. Uh, these are opportunities to make those connections. Um, Cindy does a great job in our coaching videos and really just making sure that language is the same between our administration, our schools, our students, our staff, and our parents is a big, big thing. Uh, Chris mentioned a mindfulness room and our uh, SWAT students won the Arizona Shark Tank that came in town and they won the first mindfulness room in Arizona since other schools have been doing it and they've had some great um, great feedback it, it basically it's open as long as the school is open the mindfulness room is available for uh, community members and students and staff and it's it really has uh, shaped our our culture um, if a student needs to be released from a, a school setting for whatever reason they can take their five minutes or whatever they need to to be present. Sometimes that's very important when you're trying to have conversations that may be escalated um, or they may be dealing with some things outside of school and those pressures. One of the things that we're going to be doing at Apache Junction is you, um, we are, uh, we're, we're trying to, um, trying to get funding for a, for a, mindfulness room right now and there are a lot of grant opportunities out there at my last school we were able to get one through the fiesta bowl but um what what we use that room for is and we started mindfulness at the elementary school every day uh, we did mindfulness for 10 minutes every morning to start our day and uh, i have teachers who swore by it first grade teachers who said if i don't do it then i'm in trouble um, and they saw a significant difference in student uh, behavior as well as um student discipline um additionally so at, at apache junction high school next year we're hoping to be able to use a mindfulness room in conjunction with what we would typically call uh resilient or iss um to be able to have kids be able to come in do um some time spend some time getting quiet and getting present and then reflecting on whatever it is that brought them there and then being able to go back to class instead of sitting in a classroom for the day and missing instruction 
Um, I think it's a, a much more powerful way for us to be able to address student needs and uh, help them to, to learn how to self-regulate and uh, connect to themselves. Chris, it sounds like uh, resiliency is a huge um, topic at your school. Is that, is that true? Yeah, you know, I think resiliency right now is um, my son's sticking his head in here. Sorry. Um, I think resiliency right now in schools is extremely important. It's important as a society and it's important for our kids. And um, what I have seen is that quite often we have kids who are very resilient in life, but when it gets time for school, that resiliency may fade because for so many of mine, it seems like so much of theirs is used in just everyday life. So, um, We've done a lot of uh, work as a school of building a growth mindset of it's not that uh, you haven't, you can't do it. It's not that, you know, I, there was a, a guy, George Kiley, who was a, a superintendent in New York state and George changed the entire grading system K-12 to be A, B, C, not yet. Instead of D or F, not yet. And, um, I, we're not there yet at my, at my school, but I do think that building a growth mindset of you can do it, um, you just may not be ready yet is extremely important for building resiliency. And we talk about resiliency quite a bit in the, uh, in the podcast. That's awesome. Thank you, Chris. And for our viewers, the last, I was flipping through those slides. That is our healthy leadership section. Um, Dr. Davis out of North Carolina and Dr. Lineberry both um, were, are the authors of that section, but really help connect uh, whether we're in a remote uh, situation or on campus, the ways that our, um, our leaders can, be, can have this healthy approach, whether it's the administration to the teachers or the teacher to the students, or again, the students to the students. It's a great section to, uh, to really engage our students and, and become student leaders. And, and vice versa, but it's shaping that, that healthy mindset. Um, I'm going to flip through these fast because I think we're about out of time. <clears throat> so if you guys would think about some questions you have, I'm going to go through the last couple of modules. Uh, healthy classrooms, that is basically your movement-driven learning. Um, this is something we designed over at ASU and made these connections. There's three levels. We have many templates in there for your, your teachers. Uh, the minutes out of your seat contest, uh, it's, it's a way to, it's, if, again, if you're competitive uh, like myself, it's a way to uh, compete against other schools, other teachers, and connecting health and, and physical activity in your lessons, no matter what grade you're in, no matter what level you're at. Um, and then the classroom design, just designing that classroom to fit the opportunity to embed physical movement uh, uh, and health opportunities into your lessons. Physical activity can be done uh, remotely. We can, I know there's a lot of resources out there that we're going to help connect physical activity with. Um, Chris talks about recess programming for our K-8 schools. And then we started at the high school level, what's called the healthy hour. Um, so whether it's before school, during school, or after school, or in a remote setting, uh, we can still build hope. We can still build engagement for our kids and show them that the physical activity and the health and the social emotional climate is more important now than <clears throat> it has been ever. Um, finally, we cap it off with nutrition and Kyleen is, um, she's just finished her module on remote um, <clears throat> schooling, but the connection between what is um, able to help not only our engagement and, and opportunities for kids to be more healthy, to avoid different viruses and those things that are happening, she, um, she made it another connection with, with her nutrition section. So um, guys, I'm gonna open it up now. I think Jeannie's gonna close it with some questions, but uh, thank you for listening and hopefully you got to see the insight to what our healthy school guide looks like. Uh, and, and thank you for listening. And Chris, thank you for your time. And we're thank you, Shane. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Uh, and see if this works. So let me see. There's a couple of questions that um, maybe you could you could take a stab at. Um, 
Is there any work being done around sexual and reproductive health? Um, in Arizona, we're basically, we're very limited in what we can do there. Um, it's more about education of um, anatomy, et cetera, and a um, abstinence. Um, so it's, uh, we're, we're very limited in what we can do uh, when it comes to that, unfortunately. I think a lot of states are in, in similar positions, so I understand yeah. that. Um, and um, Shannon noted that they're doing a swag group in Arkansas, and she'd love to have some more information or, or to have a conversation about how to improve their program. Is there a way that we can find you all and connect with you if we'd like to learn more? Yeah, um, I can uh, send everybody my email address, and I'm sure Shane will do the same. And you can also go to our website, uh, corepurposeconsulting.com, um, as well as uh, we've got Twitter, and you know, Shane's got all that. Uh, he's our social media guy, so um, they can stay connected that way as well. Awesome. Great. Uh, Caitlin will send that out after the webinar. Thank you for that. Uh, just wanted to, any other questions before we close out? I'd just like to add, Jeannie, uh, thank you yeah. guys. Thank you everyone for being resilient yourselves. And we, uh, Chris and I, we're, we're in Arizona, but we're in your hearts, number one, and we're here to, to volunteer our time and help uh, in this situation still connect our, our health and and wellness um, advocacy to you guys uh, to help promote that and continue this again in this time we need it more than ever so thank you guys for everything thank you Jeannie and Caitlin. absolutely absolutely yeah. we appreciate you being here we appreciate your time and uh, especially with things being a bit hectic right now so and we're glad that we got to see your son's little face there just for <laughs> <laughs> well I, I'd just like to close with one comment that really hits home for me, and that is that um, kids make up a small portion of our population, but they make up 100% of our future. And they're counting on us right now to be good examples and to show them resiliency and grit and the ability to, um, to, to overcome adversity and navigate through difficult times while taking care of ourselves and each other. So be well, everyone. Great point. I'll hit the treadmill after this. Um, thank you so much for your time. I want to let folks know that we have some other webinars coming up. You can always check our website um, for our full uh, list of scheduled webinars. Um, for that question um, about, how, uh, about sex education, we have the updated National Sex Ed Standards that's coming on the 8th of April. So please take a minute to, to check that out. Um, I also wanted to remind everyone that this uh, webinar is eligible for um, continuing education through NCHEC. And you can also get a participation certificate if you have a different credentialing body that you'd like to submit to. Um, for those of you who are ASHA members, either of those are free. If you are not an ASHA member, there is a fee for those. But you can also join and get those for free. Um, if you would like to um, receive continuing education, you'll fill out the evaluation that Caitlin is going to place in the chat box. So you'll just click on that and, and fill that out very quickly. And again, please um, think about joining us in Albuquerque. I know travel it seems like a far off dream at this point. Um, but, uh, and also feel free to reach out to us through our website, um, give us a call, connect on social media. We really thank you for being with us today and we appreciate all the work that you all are doing during this really critical time. And thank you, Chris and William, for your time today. It was thank tremendous. You. And thank you, Caitlin, for all of your, uh, background support. It's been invaluable. Thank you, Caitlin. Thank you, Jeannie. Thank Thanks you, everybody. Everyone. Have a great day. Stay healthy. You as well.